Thank you. Take care. Uh, our next speaker this morning is representing the Mars Society, well known to many in the room, and that's Bob Zubrin. Bob, uh, welcome. Um, Phil, are we going to be able to project my charts? Or, uh, oh, there we are. Okay, thanks. Um, uh, Mr. Augustine, uh, members of the committee, um, I'd like to thank you for inviting you, uh, me here to uh, express my uh, views and insights and those of the Mars Society on where the American Space Program should be going. And uh, to thank you for uh, coming out of your private pursuits to do this activity, because I, I think this is a very important activity uh, that you're engaged in here. I um, hope you'll uh, forgive me if I just take a few seconds uh, to present my credentials, since some people here might not be uh, familiar with me. Uh, I'm an engineer with a master's in aeronautics and astronautics and a doctorate in nuclear engineering. I have over two decades of aerospace industry uh, experience including uh, seven years uh, at Martin Marietta, uh, Denver, um, and uh, Lockheed Martin, at doing preliminary design of interplanetary missions. And I also, uh, for a number of years, have run my own company, Pioneer Astronautics, which has uh, done around, uh, successfully, about 40 NASA contracts of various sorts, uh, written over 200 publications, including uh, nine patents and eight books, uh, five of which are in this and uh, I also lead the Mars Society, international organization of people committing to furthering the exploration of Mars, uh, which has done various things, the most notable of which has been to establish a, a simulated human Mars exploration station in the high Arctic on Devon Island uh, nine, in the polar desert, 900 miles from the North Pole. Okay. Uh, my remarks today are going to cover uh, a number of uh, areas. Uh, first of all, um, why NASA needs a definitive goal with a definitive schedule, um, what that goal needs to be, and how it can be accomplished um, in that kind of way. So uh, to begin, um, the, the, you know, in recent years, in fact, it's now rolling into decades, people have been uh, uh, concerned politicians, congressmen, journalists, why are we stuck in Earth orbit? Why have we not gone anywhere since the conclusion of the Apollo program? And uh, it, it's a very valid concern, and, and it needs to be addressed. And um, I think it can be addressed if you look at how NASA has actually operated uh, over its history. It's operated in two fundamentally different modes of operation, uh, one of which is that which prevailed in the Apollo era from 61 to about 73, and I call that the Apollo mode. And the other, which has uh, prevailed since, which uh, therefore I call the shuttle era mode or shuttle mode for shorthand. Okay. Now, there's two completely different styles of operation uh, that were engaged in these two periods. In um, the Apollo mode, uh, what's done is national leadership sets a definitive goal with a definitive schedule. NASA is assigned to figure out how to do it on that schedule. A mission is designed. Components are designed to fulfill that mission. They're built and the mission is flown. One, two, three, by the numbers. That's how we got to the moon. The shuttle mode, on the other hand, okay, what happens is, is programs are proposed by various constituencies, whether constituencies in the technical community, from various NASA centers, from uh, various states or other interests, and uh, some of these uh, make it through the political system, and we get an assortment of technical programs undertaken which are not really coordinated with each other, and which are su subsequently justified by a rationale which is produced to be able to claim that these programs would be useful at some point in the future when someone actually had a mission to go somewhere. Okay. If you want to use a metaphor to compare these two modes of operation, think of two couples, each of which would like to have their dream house. Couple A talk about their dream house, and then they hire an architect to design the dream house, and they get it, the drawing done, and then they go to a contractor, they build the house, and they have their house. Couple B go out, goes out every weekend and cruises garage sales and sees items that they think might be of interest at some point in the future when they want to build a house. So they pick up a spiral staircase, some direct columns, 
you know, aluminum siding, whatever, and they pile it up in the backyard. And then uh, every once in a while when the in-laws come to visit and Pond Law says, why do you have all this junk piled in your backyard? Uh, they say, well, it, it's to build a house. And he says, well, I'd like to see the plans of this house. So they hire an architect and they sell him, look, we want you to design a house and it has to include all of these parts. So the house is never built, but embarrassment is avoided because a rationale is produced for the various purchases. And um, so that is, is the difference of the two modes of operation. And it is apparent which one is going to be more productive, and the numbers show it. You, you know, um, if you take NASA's budget from 1961 to 1973, and you add it up in today's dollars, it's around $230 billion. Divide that by 13, it's $18 billion a year, which is the same as NASA's budget this year. That is, during the Apollo period, while there was, the, like, 1966, it was more, in other years it was less, uh, on average, NASA's budget over that period was the same uh, within a few percent of what it is this year or last year, and uh, frankly, the same in general order uh, of what it's been since 1990. So let's compare what NASA accomplished with that budget between 61 and 73 compared to what it accomplished with the same budget between 1997 and today. Okay? Between 1961 and 1973, NASA built and flew Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, Skylab, okay, uh, Ranger, uh, Surveyor, Mariner. Um, we did all the technology needed to uh, development to do Pioneer, Viking, Voyager. Uh, we uh, some uh, over 30 lunar and planetary missions in that list. Uh, we did technology development of a, an amazing uh, sort. We developed hydrogen, oxygen rocket engines, multi-stage heavy lift launch vehicles, in-space life support, space suits, in deep space navigation techniques, deep space communication techniques, uh, space rendezvous techniques, uh, lunar landing techniques, re-entry techniques. Um, uh, nuclear rocket engines, nuclear space nuclear reactors, radioisotope thermal generators, um, the list goes on. The entire bag of tricks that we use to do everything that we do in space was developed. And we developed the Deep Space Tracking Network, and we built Cape Canaveral, and Johnson Space Center, and Jet Propulsion Lab, the works, and we inspired uh, a generation of youth to want to enter science, a point that I'll get to again later. That, that, that by comparison, with the same budget, between 1997 and, ni and 2009, NASA flew 47 shuttle missions, which allowed them to repair and upgrade the Hubble Space Telescope and partially build a space station. And we flew about a dozen lunar and planetary probes, and we did no significant technology development. So comparing these two records of accomplishment over identical periods with identical budgets, it is difficult to come to any other conclusion that the, the, the degree of accomplishment that one can get using the Apollo mode of operation is at least, at least, in order of magnitude, more effective than can be done with the shuttle mode of uh, let's just work on technologies and do projects that are interesting and potentially valuable, and someday we'll have the set of tools we need to go, uh, as Mr. O'Keefe put it, anywhere, anytime. Okay. The first program works. The second essentially does not. Um, the 